Well, um, last but not least, uh, for the day at least, on a, we, on a Friday afternoon, on a Friday afternoon <laughs> as the ambassador has said, uh, we're very pleased to be here with you for a quick uh, and hopefully very lively and engaging discussion on uh, digital diplomacy. My name is Petros Petrikos. I am a researcher at the University of Nicosia and uh, a project manager for the Diplomatic Academy, which is the knowledge partner for this panel. Um, uh, uh, our panel is, uh, uh, our, it consists of four people with us. We also have uh, online, uh, I would like to start from uh, Dr. Cornelio Biola, who is an associate professor of diplomatic studies at the University of Oxford and the head of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group. Um, uh, then we have uh, Dr. Federica Bicchi on my far right, who is uh, an associate professor in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics and the director of the European Foreign Policy Unit of the LSC. And uh, last but not least, we have Ambassador Aeronoram Evribidis Evribiadis, who uh, has had a long career serving the Cyprus diplomatic service for 43 years in different posts, starting his career at the UN in 1976, uh, winning throughout this period of several awards and also publishing on different topics on, with regards to diplomacy. So we have a very hybrid panel, both consisting of experts but also uh, academics. And uh, I do hope that we manage to touch upon this topic of which is the digital diplomacy uh, it has actually been described as a beast. I believe it was during our discussion with uh, Federica, who uh, is, is it an entity that is to be tamed or should it roam free? And um, starting off with that question, what uh, are the main developments revolving around this beast known as digital diplomacy? And uh, Dr. Bick, if you don't mind, I would like to start off with you uh, to provide some background and context uh, as to this topic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for showing up on a Friday afternoon, last panel. I think that uh, you know, it's great to uh, have you here. Thank you to people uh, watching us uh, online. Um, I'll just uh, say a couple of words uh, to frame this uh, topic. Uh, because we have uh, heard uh, uh, for the whole of today the importance of uh, uh, technology. We heard uh, the German ambassador talking about the fact that they are looking for uh, IT uh, skilled people to go to Germany. We have uh, heard during the UN General Assembly uh, how AI can help with the sustainable development goals. Uh, AI seems to be everywhere. And it is coming also to diplomacy, uh, which is a bit of a secretive uh, word and seems a slightly different, slightly separated from what everyone else uh, is doing. But in a way, I think that uh, diplomacy is being transformed by uh, technology and digital technology in particular. To start with, I just would like to remind ourselves of the definition of uh, diplomacy. Uh, the, um, there are plenty of definitions uh, out there, but uh, one uh, uh, that works well is the management of international relations by negotiation and mediation. This is interesting because it puts mediation at the heart of uh, diplomacy. There are a number of uh, estranged entities that may be previously were a single country, think of West Germany and East Germany. Um, and diplomacy is the go-between, is the mediating effort between these exchange entities. What does digital diplomacy then add to this mix? Digital technologies further mediate the contact. Uh, we kind of assume that diplomacy is about person to person and instead most of what is uh, happening uh, at the moment in fact is mediated uh, by digital technology. So in, in a way we're entering uh, in a bit of a new universe. You might say te uh, technology was always there, the telegraph, the phone, the, you know, the, the, the uh, invention of paper, but now it, it is a particular moment 
uh, and one that prompts us to consider whether we are entering a sort of a post-human diplomacy world where the relevance of technology is such that it's transforming the way diplomacy is uh, conducted, performed, uh, and what it, it actually means. Um, I'll uh, mention just uh, three aspects of this. The first one is as a tool. Um, when we talk about diplomacy as a tool, and I know that uh, my colleagues will talk more about this, but um, we have to imagine by now a sort of a seamless blending of human and technological interventions. So a diplomatic initiative might start with a WhatsApp message, uh, might continue with uh, an in-person coffee, but before that in-person coffee, maybe there is a, a last me minute Google search about the person uh, that uh, the diplomat is going to meet, uh, certainly a few emails, emails to follow, um, a report that maybe is first shared through um, electronic means protected by a degree of confidentiality, um, and maybe uh, it ends up in a WhatsApp message again, like for instance the one between the Greek uh, Minister of Migration and the Turkish Minister of Migration recently to seal a deal about uh, the land border. So somehow we are in this blended universe uh, of human and technology uh, working together. Uh, also, uh, this post-human diplomacy is uh, characterized as a topic. Loads of diplomatic negotiations at the moment are focusing on technology um, uh, as uh, in the form of uh, uh, advisory boards, uh, in the form of national initiatives like in the case of China or in the form of uh, EU acts. We've seen uh, at the moment there are loads of EU acts uh, being discussed, uh, the AI act being the last one. Last but not least, uh, the uh, digitalization of diplomacy is uh, happening in a context that is heavily um, polarized in terms of geopolitics as well. And therefore, there is an emphasis on competition uh, and what this uh, can bring. And here, it's interesting because in fact, the material aspect, the geo aspect of geopolitics, it uh, brings us back to the material uh, basis of this where the cables go underwater, uh, the chips uh, that are used, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I think that we are uh, at a very interesting moment uh, to stop and talk about uh, digital diplomacy because there are really a lot of aspects that have a, an influence on transparency. But I'll leave that here. Thank you very much, uh, Federica, for your uh, input. And indeed, you have, you've touched upon the different definitions, uh, as we've said, and uh, you've uh, referred to the tools as well. You've begun mentioning the tools, and for that, I would actually like to yield the floor to uh, Dr. Biola. Uh, are you, you are with us? Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can I can hear you well. well. I can, I can hear, hear you very well. well. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to ask you to share a bit more about the tools and the different methods that we see uh, different uh, uh, diplomats or other political actors use when in engaging with uh, these piece, uh, the digital diplomacy? Uh, first, first of all, thank you very much, uh, the organizers of Cyprus Forum, but also, also the Brian Academy for inviting me. Let me also take the opportunity to uh, say hello to Professor uh, Bicky. We had a, a similar panel in, in February talking on the same issue, but also the ambassador Rubikis uh, Iriatis, with whom uh, we had uh, an excellent first meeting in London years ago discussing, interestingly, um, similar topics. Um, um, many days have uh, and months you know, have passed since then, um, and the digital diplomacy continues to evolve. And I think that the question of, of instruments and methods, I think it's, it's, uh, it's evolving. So how to approach this issue? Um, so let me build on, on what Professor Bicke said before. And I like this idea of, of digital diplomacy uh, changing uh, something uh, from the, uh, uh, probably more importantly about the way in which diplomacy operates. This question has been from the beginning. I think we asked them, uh, asked that question in, in the, the, the event organized by Ambassador Liliades uh, in, in London in 2015, 2016. 
Is digital, are digital technologies changing fundamentally diplomacy? Are they affecting its DNA? Or is something that is being played out at the margins in terms of certain type of new instruments that are being added, whether it's a WhatsApp like uh, the Telegraph used to be before or something else? And they think at the beginning, in 2016, the, the, the feeling was that it's not much. I think I started to change my views of that more recently. And the, the reason is that um, we have new technologies. And let me start developing this point. When you think about digital diplomacy, you usually apply two different frames. One is we look at uh, how these new technologies emerge. Uh, it is a kind of stage approach, stage model, in which new technologies emerge, and then MFAs and diplomats look around and try to identify opportunities. Opportunities to improve their work, to make it more effective. And we see that, we saw that with social media. Social media was the first, the first stage, 2010, 2012. Uh, the, the idea was that these instruments can help what? Can help with public diplomacy. That was a big thing at that time. Uh, and it worked until we got to the dark side. And the dark side is information started to create problems. And then we have the new adaptation with strategic communication units trying and inside the MFAs trying to deal with this information. And then we had uh, a new instrument uh, during the pandemic, exactly what we're using right now, Zoom, right? And the teleconference, interestingly, these uh, instruments continue after the pandemic to be used because they, are quite, uh, they provide a good opportunity for people to coordinate their positions, start on the NATO summits and so on. And what, what is happening right, right now, I think, what I, I feel this model is not proper one, one is that it sort of looks at only the issue of opportunity, and that puts a lot of emphasis on social media. But I think there is a different model, and we have to pay attention to this. The different model that I think we start to sense is the technological acceleration model. What it means is means that these technologies that we see changes more fundamentally than the context in which diplomacy operates. Changes what? Changes by the fact that it, it accelerates the, the time in which we have to react. The defining feature of this kind of transformation is speed, not opportunity, speed. You have to react faster on social media to control the narrative. You have to react faster you know, with Zoom because you need to coordinate positions in times of crisis. And they think what we see nowadays is with AI, and they think this is probably the next big thing, is that we need this kind of instruments to improve our decisions. And this opens up a whole new game, in my view. I'm writing a paper on this at the moment, in which I discuss exactly this. Where do we see, where are we going with this? I think, because we, we also this is a Cyprus uh, event, I think there are three different scenarios in which you can see this display being playing out. The first scenario that you see with some of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs you know, using this kind of uh, technology, especially AI, is let's say the, 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 the Dallas Icarus uh, myth, Greek myth, uh, in which you should try, uh, many I, I, I fear the Icarus moment, you fly too close to the sun and you get burnt. So you play safe, you play like the Dallas, you reach Sicily, you reach Sicily because you don't take risk. And, and we, we see this kind of application of AI for processing consular affairs. This is another, another way in which you know, processing visas or uh, chatbots you know, to interact. This is the this is the, the uh, uh, scenario. A second one in which you start to take more risk, but, but you have to be careful is the Arachne, you know, the goddess, uh, the, the, the weaver that challenged uh, Athena, uh, and, and then you get punished. You, you take risk, but you are not prepared. You are not prepared to do certain things that you can burn. And that they think, you know, there is, uh, for some Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they think, you know, they can do a lot of, of new tools in terms of uh, using, you know, press releases or playing, you know, a little bit more, but they feel that, you know, the risk of, of, of getting it back, um, uh, especially in the conditions that uh, AI is not necessarily very well developed at the moment, could be, could be bad. And the, the last one which I really like, and that, that takes me to the point of post-human uh, diplomacy, Professor Vicky, is the Heracles model, in which you take risk, you win, and you join, join the dust. 
indigenous practice was invited to later join the Gadas because he overcame the 12 uh, labors. And, and, and then, then you see this kind of effort being put in which AI actually, because of the speed, you have to uh, be more careful about how to do negotiations, um, how to prepare for negotiations, and, and, and to adapt to this. So what I'm saying here is that the new tools that we see now being developed in digital diplomacy are not necessarily about opportunity as such, as they used to be with social media, but more about the fact that time and speed is, is, is becoming, becoming an imperative, and, and you, you have, have to adapt, adapt to the speed necessarily, not the, the opportunities that arise. And I'm going to start, start here with my uh, commentary for the moment. Thank you very much, Dr. Biola. Uh, you've touched upon a lot of uh, uh, interesting questions there, but before we go on, I would also like to ask the ambassador to share some uh, insights as regard regarding with to this question: How do you how, how have you interacted in this context when it comes to digital di diplomacy throughout your career? First, uh, just call me by my first name. My name is Euripides, and I'd like to be called by that. Uh, I echo the sentiments of the previous distinguished speakers in thanking you and the Zytro Forum and each and every one of you for being here to attend this on a Friday afternoon. And of course, special thanks to Cornelio. We, we go way back with the Professor Biola. So it's a great pleasure even to see you through cyberspace, uh, which is another testament of how technology is involved in diplomacy, as we call hybrid diplomacy. I think it was Darwin that said that the species that will survive are not necessarily the strongest ones, but the ones that are able to adapt to change. And I think we, diplomats, as diplomatic species, will not survive if we do not adopt and adapt this technology, knowing and be cognizant of its good, being cognizant of its bad, being cognizant of its ugly, hashtag dark side, as we used to say in so many, in so many things. The, the trick is, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not a professor, I'm not a man of academia, I've, I've been a practitioner, as Petrus has said, for 43 years. And when you represent Cyprus, it's, uh, you have another definition of diplomacy and another definition of a diplomat because everything, yes, uh, diplomacy is uh, uh, management international relations uh, through mediation. Uh, um, at the same time, you do represent and protect and promote the interests of your country. And the key thing is to be able to converge those interests with others in order to have to have, a, 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 to have a, an agreement. So the most challenging part for me, the most challenging part for me, if I can sh share that, is really making sure that the use of technology, that the output was commensurative to the time input. Because there are, there are only 25, hour, 25 hours in the day, yeah? There is only, so you have to target, you have to prioritize, and doing, you know, I was very, very active on Twitter. I mean, uh, uh, for a long time, I had more, more followers than my own ministry. But what's, what's the moral of that? Every other day, I used to be reprimanded by my permanent secretary. Ah, this is not serious. What is, I said, it wasn't meant to be serious. This is serious. That is not serious. You have to cast a white net. So when somebody looked at my in my, uh, my EEG uh, uh, Twitter account, they could never make out whether I was an ambassador, whether I was a tour operator, whether I was, uh, uh, whether I was uh, an energy expert, which I'm not, Charles here, Charles here is, uh, uh, whether I was uh, uh, an archaeologist. And the answer is, it's all of the above, because you are a practitioner. And my professor used to say that in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Because you have so many factors and variables that you have to take into consideration, and you have to survive in the system. And if you really go against the system, you know what? It's not career enhancing. So you, 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 the trick is to be able to take this technology, the digital aspect of it, and translate it into offline effectiveness. 
If you're not effective in that, I think it's just about a waste of time. The biggest challenge that I think we'll address, and please feel free to interrupt me because I'm a little bit of a blabbermouth and, 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 uh, and you have to stop me. Uh, um, the, the, the trick is to be able, to, your online presence to make it offline effectiveness. And the biggest challenge that we're going to be facing, all of us are going to be facing, is AI. Now that is a beast, a real beast that needs to be understood, to be grasped, to be tamed, to be contained. And it's a huge thing how AI will be, will be affecting diplomacy, it's already affecting diplomacy, and not just the light aspect of ask GDP about something and you get an answer. That, that's kindergarten stuff. We have to think hard of how it does, deep fakes, how it will affect democracy, human rights, the rule of law, how it affects uh, uh, diplomacy itself, and also try to look ahead of the curve. I'm sorry if I exceeded my time. I want to stop because we have to give time for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, actually, you have touched upon a very good uh, thematic here because as we've pointed, as we've seen throughout our speaker's insights, it's a multifaceted issue. There are plenty of tools at our disposal. It has both of a light but also of a dark side, if you like. And this can be overwhelming because of the disposal of all this information that we have. Uh, it sometimes creates this sense of a fog of war, if you like. It blurs, in a way, reality. And uh, I'd like to, um, uh, in line with our theme, which is transparency, I'd like to explore a bit how we can avoid this blur with, through digital diplomacy. And uh, first I will go back to Federica to see uh, what kind of, uh, uh, how do we approach this in terms of this blending of digital and non-digital spaces as also uh, everybody's mentioned uh, uh, with the offline spaces and how do we use this to uh, uh, enhance and protect our democracy and then enhance resilience? Thank you. Um, I'll uh, just because uh, to, to keep it interesting for the Friday afternoon feeling, I'll have to disagree with my colleagues. Um, because in a way, I think it's not just time, and it's not just offline spaces that are being affected. It's online spaces that are becoming absolutely central to politics and international politics in particular. And so I think that time absolutely is uh, speeding up, but the uh, life online, what has been called on life, is taking a relevance, a political significance of its own. So unless it is online, it's not real is the common paradox. So the challenge here is how to make these online spaces democratic and transparent. Uh, and here we need all to chip in and try to follow closely what is happening. Because at times it, it is intentionally obscure uh, if people uh, don't understand what's going on. Uh, yes, it is complex, but at times it's also very beneficial to some big tech companies uh, who are keeping the power uh, very tightly in their own hands. And here, you know, we need a, a sort of a democracy from below to maintain the uh, discussion going, maintain the attention going, uh, not necessarily by rejecting technology, rather on the contrary, by engaging with technology in order to make sure that it's uh, in accordance with our democratic uh, values. But that's why I would put the emphasis on online spaces as central uh, for our discussion. Thank you, Federica. And given we are putting this emphasis on online spaces, another thing that uh, maybe Cornelio as well would like to uh, answer is this uh, issue that we see in terms of disinformation and propaganda taking place online. And this is also used as a tool th in uh, digital uh, diplomacy spaces. If you would like to uh, uh, you know, comment on that. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, 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 I like, like to support the point raised by, by uh, uh, Professor Ricky uh, about online spaces. We are talking nowadays about this new concept that didn't exist like 10 years ago, like digital sovereignty, technological sovereignty, you know, these kind of things. Because there is a feeling that this kind of all online spaces need to be regulated, especially in Europe. Right, uh, that the information environment has to function properly uh, and purge of the, the toxicity. It is also a concept uh, that continues to evolve. But I'm trying, trying to link this, uh, so I still think you know, that there's a question of time and speed here. Um, uh, uh, the, the reason for that is related to the concept that we raised at the beginning, which was the 404. What is the 404? 404 is a concept that we associate with uh, how cities. Uh, because it speaks about in this kind of environment, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about what is happening. And you have to ask yourself, why do diplomats feel uh, this concept nowadays in the context not of war, even in peace? Right? And they think there is a reason. What do diplomats, and I think the ambassador knows this practically very well. Uh, this is why he was probably reprimanded unjustly by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Because, because what, was, what was, people must try to do is to send signals. Signals, signals about, about what? The, the position of my country, the, the values I represent, right? Uh, Ambassador has, has done an excellent job in London to project certain values about Cyprus. That this is Cyprus, a country that, you know, has a certain type of feeling, a certain type of ethos. And this is what he was trying to do. Not a very rigid, very hierarchical the, the signals that he was trying to, set, uh, to send. And I think a sending signals is part of the core mission of the diplomat. We've done this before, the digital age, by stating a position, by uh, making official statements. Well, with the digital nowadays, you know, you use social media, right, to send signals. But this is a problem. You are not alone. And that connects with the topic mentioned by Professor Picky, because in these new spaces, there are many others. There are other ambassadors sending signals. Your peers. There is also the public participating in the conversation. Honest public. I'm not saying necessarily that it's a hostile public, but it's putting pressure on you to react to certain events. And there is, of course, you know, the hostile party has you know, the discussion about the uh, weaponization of, of information, the disinformation coming from uh, uh, Russia and other countries. And that creates uncertainty. And the certainty, I think, you know, for ambassadors and others is particularly important because it says something, I'm sending a signal, and I see the reaction. How strong is the reaction? Can I make sense of that? Or is, is this reaction organic? Or is it manufactured through this information and trolls and all kinds of bots and these kinds of things? Uh, so, uh, in a sense, you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, reactions to your position, to your signals, is the support increasing or decreasing? And that ties back to the poem I said before about time and speed. You have to do that. You don't have a week to think about it. You don't have a month to think about this. Like, for instance, in the past, they would have the ambassadors of you know, Britain in Constantinople for three months to reflect on the issue because this is how long it took you know, for the carriage to, to bring the, the mail. Now, certain things move very fast. And this, this is where I think, you know, it, it puts a lot of pressure on people how to react exactly in these spaces. In these spaces, there is a lot of uncertainty. And the more we see this kind of information uh, uh, inhabiting in these spaces, the more uncertainty creates. Where are we going with this? It is an important question. Uh, Ambassador Rubiat um, uh, has mentioned this, you know. Is it AI? I think. Probably at the moment, you know, uh, AI is seen as one possible instrument to deal with uncertainty. And I, I worked a little bit on that. But think about the logical conclusion. If AI is the one that can help with the uncertainty, that creates an escalation. Um, so how do we get to this point that Professor Ricky mentioned at the beginning, that the post-humanist diplomacy in which we're going to get at AI, battling AI, online in these kind of spaces, um, it seems like, uh, from what we see, uh, and that's probably the scary thing, and uh, from a practitioner like Ambassador of Trivia, it's really interesting to see how to react. Uh, is, is it the last ambassador? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, 
Dr. Viola, um, well, you, uh, sorry, you have the floor. It's very interesting. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much, Cornelia. Always getting our mental wheels turning. And thank you for disagreeing as well, uh, um, Federica. Uh, just for the fun of it. Just for the fun of it, but uh, you know. I'm not oblivious to reality. I know that what is defined as real has real consequences. Therefore, online spaces, as you say, central, okay, but I say yes and no, like a true diplomat, I mean, <laughs> trying to, to go on both sides, I say yes and no, why? Because the more things change, in a way, the more things will have to remain the same. Keep your eye on the ball. If you lose the post-humanist diplomacy, Professor Biola, my dear Cornelius, if we lose that, I think we're totally lost. The human element must always be there. I want to be able, I've made a, I've made a lifetime out of reading people's faces and knowing what they were thinking by the way they were holding their eyes. I want to be able to look at people's faces. I want to be able to negotiate. I want to be able to shake a hand. And I'm not going to rely solely, solely, uh, solely what AI is telling me or any other, or any other uh, uh, digital gadget. Uh, uh, because first of all, AIs are not, for the moment, that accurate. They hallucinate. So they give you false information. But I'm saying that if we are divorced, if we divorce diplomacy from its human element, from the basics, which is representation, negotiation, people to people. It's hybrid diplomacy. Let's call it hybrid diplomacy. I think it's, we, you know, it's an invention of, of Oxford University and of Professor Viola. It's hybrid. Yes, right now we're doing diplomacy through Zoom, okay, but at the same time, keep our, our, our eyes on the ball. It is time, uh, uh, time and speed. Is that good or bad? I mean, uh, uh, President Jefferson said that we, didn't, we have not heard from our ambassador in Spain in the last two years. If we do not hear from him again this year, perhaps we should write him a letter. Now, we have come a long way, but also too much speed and, uh, and, 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 and time and immediate, real, immediate decisions I think sometimes we can see at the tree, we can see the tree and lose the forest. You need time to reflect. You know, we are being pushed and we're being driven. Uh, and we should govern technology and technology shouldn't govern us. I mean, I know for a long while when I was doing social media, I was suffering from FOMO, fear of missing out. Ah, oh, FOMO, okay, yeah, keep looking. I tell you, I, I, what did so and so say? I need to react to that. Hey, hey. Hold your horses. Sit back, think, reflect. This is what diplomacy is all about. It's going to be more and more challenging because with deep fakes, what, uh, what you be said, all we'll be saying about the dark side and information, disinformation, the fact that, that AI can really mimic you and, 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 and it's you when in fact it's not you. And I'm going to take a decision based on that? No. I'm going, to, I'm going to seek him out and really try to, 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 to see what is happening because uh, uh, um, uh, again, I mean, what comes to my mind for some reason, I don't know how mine works, is Marlost Faust, uh, when there is a section that says you might think that you're dancing with the devil, but it is the devil dancing with you. Humans must remain in control. We have a situation with AI where they are developing in terms of AI time. Years are in terms of weeks, months. We are developing a situation where AI will be thinking and will be creating information and it will be making suggestions on foreign policy and AIs are going to be talking among themselves. I think I find that dangerous and, and frankly frightening. We have to learn to, to ride the wave we have to adapt and adopt by being very, very cognizant of, of, of what the dark side is and, of course, try to contain it. Uh, 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 Suleiman, uh, uh, Mustafa Suleiman is talking about containment. Uh, maybe he's the ca canon of the Cold War of how to contain these things, uh, uh, Cornelia. Thank you. Thank you, too.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we, we, we have some time for questions, if, you, if there are any. Uh, we will take the uh, first one here at the front and then at the one at the back. And, uh, if people can introduce yes, and if you can uh, also introduce yourselves and then we'll take a third one. Do we have uh, time for a third question as well? Yes, okay. Thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. In fact, this is, for me personally, this is uh, one of the most interesting discussions because well, my name is Andre Goodfriend and I had been the director of the Office of E-Diplomacy at the U.S. State Department for a couple of years from 2000. 17 to 2019, a Foreign Service officer, diplomat after 30 years. So I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Ambassador, about the need to keep humans centric, uh, centered at, at the center of the process. I don't think we're at, in a post-human era of diplomacy. The Office of E-Diplomacy that I headed for a while, in fact, was created to insert diplomats into the process and not have diplomacy be technology driven, which, w which was a risk 20 years ago, as the technologists thought, we're going to use technology to change the way diploma diplomacy is carried out. The pushback, you know, the, re the, re the re reaction, was to ensure that diplomats are engaged in shaping how we use diplomacy, and that's why that office was created. The, uh, so that you know, as we've moved forward, and I'd be curious you know, on, your, on your thoughts on this, you know, as we've moved forward, the, it's, we no longer, in fact, need to have special offices that uh, insert technology into what we're doing because most of our diplomatic colleagues now, 20 years later, have become comfortable with using the technologies so that it's no longer technology driven or data, data driven. In fact, the conversation now is should we say it's data driven diplomacy? And I think even that's being pushed aside by data informed diplomacy that humans, that the diplomats themselves have enough of an understanding of the technology to engage via Twitter or to engage via other social media or to draw on data and use tools, whether it's AI or other analytical tools, to help them make the decisions. And this is where I'd like to just touch on that aspect of speed being a, a new factor in what technology has created. That it's you, perhaps 10 years ago, with you know, television all, you know, always on everywhere, there was a need to react without information at our fingertips. But now through the technologies that we have, we spend a lot less time looking for the information we need so that even with less time to react, we have more time to make a decision, to actually reflect. So in, in some respects, I, I'm, I'm very much agreeing with the ambassador, but I have some difficulties with the perspectives of those who are, who are putting technology too much at the forefront and not recognizing that in fact humans are, uh, at this point are are drawing on that technology to facilitate diplomacy. Uh, thank you. Let's quickly here take all the questions. We, so we have, there was one, uh, another one at the back, and then another one at the front, and then uh, we can uh, answer them all together. Thank you. Uh, many thank you. I would like to first say thank you for your valuable insights and, uh, and uh, enjoyable conversation. Um, I would like to touch upon the issue of containment, as Mr. Everybody has mentioned earlier. Um, we are now seeing uh, many authorities around the world scrambling to actually contain this new technology and impose rules on it. Um, so first I would like your opinion on do you think is, if this is a step in the right direction as in uh, ex post rules that aim to mitigate the harm after it's done or would a preferable approach be to find a way to solve the problems before they even occur? And that is actually an interesting subject because tomorrow we are uh, hosting a panel on how technology can be used in politics yes. uh, in mid, uh, the classic hotel Midday. So it, it seems an interesting um, conjunction of the two as in 
how can technology actually help to facilitate more transparent and more democratic procedures? So, yeah. Thank you. And uh, the third question. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, I understand that probably, and it is a question, it is better to uh, have a human diplomacy rather than a robot diplomacy, or, or, or human ambassadors like, uh, rather than uh, robot ambassadors, because uh, the human interventions offers the uncertainty. I, I was thinking about that because of what you, um, you expressed before. What do you think about that? Where is the answer? Thank you. Um, so we will uh, begin uh, answering the first question on uh, the on the post-human aspect of uh, diplomacy, the data-driven versus the informed uh, diplomacy, and how. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Dr. Biola, if you you have the floor. No, well, thank, thank you very much. much uh, maybe maybe for, for all those, these questions, questions. I, I think, think that they go with the, the core of, 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 of the dilemma that we are facing uh, at the moment. Uh, and I think uh, I'm not trying to suggest here that you know, the robots should be placed in diplomats, of course. I'm just saying that you know, there are constraints on, how, on, on what diplomats can do. And these constraints come from the fact that there is a lot of information that is less and less time to uh, um, deal with this kind of information. There was some interesting statistic I saw last week, uh, but this statistic changed, so you have to take them with a grain of salt. Uh, the generative AI, which is not intelligent AI, generative AI predicts, you know, the most likely uh, number or word, you know, from a big uh, data set. So generative AI is likely uh, to reach uh, the medium level of performance of a human by the end of this decade and uh, to surpass 95% of humans by 2040. So what does it mean? It's going to do much better than humans. So from this point of view, you may see uh, a push you know, for Ministry of Foreign Affairs in certain areas to deal with that. So post-human is not about the robot replacing, but about how the two are going to integrate and how to uh, at what level you see these kind of tools applied. The direction, I think, that I uh, connect to the third question, the direction that we see nowadays in terms of how to deal with this problem is by creating levels of risk. The European AI Act, which is supposed to be passed a number of readings and is supposed to be adopted by the end of this year, talks about four levels of, of, of um, risk. So, so that's, that's a model. model. High level risk uh, in which they say, well, we shouldn't allow AI to interfere, medium level of risk, you know, low level of risk. So, so I think, you know, for, for an MFA, this is probably is, uh, is going to be a model to adopt in the sense, you know, in much areas uh, you're going to see, uh, because they are doing better, uh, uh, certain things, you know, to, uh, to be uh, done. Um, shall we, uh, and this is not science fiction, this is not science fiction. Um, the Chinese, I mean, they are very of what they are doing, but um, they've been pushing a lot of effort, for instance, to develop this kind of AI-informed, if you like it, it's not AI-driven, AI-informed, for instance, uh, models to understand where it's better to invest um, in the development road, given all kinds of conditions. Can a diplomat can do this? Of course it can do it. It can have a, a bigger team and uh, experts and can draw different expertise on question and can do it. Can it do it faster and more accurate? I'm not sure about that. Maybe now, but maybe in a couple of years, maybe not. And if you are faster, this is what I'm saying, you have a competitive advantage. And that I think is the drive that we have to see for MFA. It's not, I'm not advocating that, you know, uh, Ambassador to just be the last human ambassador. But I'm saying that there are severe constraints in terms of how to handle the volume of information and the speed for decisions in conditions in which you are in competition with others. And probably um, I'm going to leave it here at, here, uh, at this point. But uh, that's, uh, I think, you know, what, uh, what, what I see this going with the new technology. Technologies. Thank you, Dr. Viola. Dr. Biki, if you have. Have uh, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to suggest that post-human diplomacy uh, points towards uh, robot diplomacy and that's it. Uh, but at the same time, I find it fascinating, for instance, to see the transformation in consular affairs, where uh, the human element is reduced uh, more and more. And in the case of the Canadian, uh, I mean, unfortunately, even more. Uh, the Brits are going down exactly the same route, not for the final decision in certain cases, but uh, by constructing a, layers, a set of layers of technological decisions that pre-order the field. So to get to that human element, there is a bit of a technological barrier in between. Um, does it help or does it not help? But this is what we need to discuss. You know, this is where the politics comes in. Uh, I mean, is it good to find a chatbot <laughs> when you're asking for help? Um, maybe it's good if it, you know, your fridge is not working. <laughs> it's less good <laughs> if you're stuck um, in the middle of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, these are the type of uh, topics that we need to uh, talk about in order to be all comfortable uh, with the outcome. Um, keeping in mind that um, the technology creates big digital divides um, so that not only one third of humans are you know, off the internet, etc., but uh, the, the level of engagement with the technology, the sophistication of the technology available to diplomats of 193 uh, uh, countries, it, it's, it's very different. And therefore, you know, one direction might be open for some, but not uh, for others. And so we need to keep an eye also on that aspect of humanity. Uh, you know, that, that there are some uh, um, diplomatic services that encounter uh, a, a different level of technological challenges. At the same time, to finish on the uh, uh, optimist uh, side, uh, I mean, for small countries, it can be uh, an unexpected bonus so that helps them to project well beyond uh, what they would otherwise be able to. So, I mean, we need to keep everything uh, uh, discussing all these points. And if I might quickly add, like a whole, the whole discussion on small countries, small states is a whole other topic, but very interesting to also see how it can be integrated in this. Um, if, if I can take a hook from that. Technology can help small and medium-sized countries, properly leveraged, can help small and medium-sized countries punch above their weight. I have, I'm 100% I'm convinced about that, and that was my empirical experience uh, in using. You mentioned consular affairs, correct? Immediate f human crisis, floods, terrorists, attacks, immediately you have, you're able to do it in zero time. There you need speed. And you need it immediately because people's lives are at stake. And you have to come through and, and the taxpayer will judge you how efficient you are or not by the way you, re, you respond. So uh, yes, technology can and it should. And like I said at the beginning, we have to adapt and adopt. At the same time, we have to be very, very cognizant. I have colleagues that came to me, well, I read it, uh, uh, chat GDP. Oh, uh, uh, Professor Google told me. I said, who is Professor Google? I never heard of him. Go back to the drawing board. You know, in, in, like we used to write a paper at the university and we, you had to cross your references, not just parroting, think critically, but use it effectively. Containment, I want to do to, to, to on that. How do you contain something that it is really emerging? I think it's, uh, and I, I think it was the UK uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister that addressed the General Assembly the other day that he said, rightly so, and I agree, we cannot afford to become trapped in debates about whether AI is a tool for good or a tool for ill. It will be tool of both. And knowing what it is, grasp it, 
legislate on it, contain it in the sense that you have, you know, at, at, the, at, the, at the national level and at the regional level, and if you want at the international level. I mean, internationally, you have, the, for instance, the uh, um, International Atomic Energy Agency, which is an agency fully devoted to, to, to atomic and to nuclear power. Okay? Nuclear weapons do not become smarter. AI becomes smarter. Nuclear weapons do not take decisions by themselves. It is the human, Truman, that decided to use nuclear weapons. It was a human that decided. It wasn't artificial intelligence. It was a somebody that made this. So, and it can be contained through, yes, it's difficult, but it will also take a different mindset. I mean, uh, uh, Professor Biola spoke about uh, sovereignty, meta-sovereignty, internet sovereignty. States will have to have a different concept of sovereignty as well and allow the Googles and the Microsofts to be at the table. To, so they too, because they, they, are, they are the generators of this, they too are there to tell us what they're doing. For instance, one thing that you can do to contain is really outlaw bots that pretend to be humans. To be outlawed. I think that's one thing that we can think about. We can think many, many more in order to have this. We don't want, uh, how shall I say, a digital or an AI curtain descending upon the continent, <laughs> descending among the, uh, the, 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 the global north and the global south, because everybody has to have a pie, in, uh, has to have a, a piece of the pie in this, just as social media, you know, when it first came out, now everybody is engaging in social media. The Global South as well. The same thing with artificial intelligence. It should not just be, of course, with the Americans and the Chinese. And we haven't even touched the issue of dual usage and the military aspect of, of, of artificial intelligence. The same artificial intelligence that will drive an autonomous vehicle is the same artificial intelligence that can drive a tank. And it will, it will decide where to shoot. I want to, of course, finish on a positive note <laughs> and to say, <laughs> make love, not war. That was, you know, that was the theme of my generation. <laughs> you know, now they make love and war at the same time, so but it's terrible. But anyhow. Thank you very Cornelia, much. Cornelia, it was such a great pleasure to see you, even through via Vice Space. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have uh, overrun. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their insights and actually engaging in such a nice discussion. It's a multifaceted issue. It has so many different angles to it. But I hope that, that this will be the start of a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, it is already happening, actually. So, uh, And uh, thank you as well, our audience uh, who are here and also watching us from home, who have stayed with us until the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.